that I'm going to turn. And now I'm going to turn the program over to my Virginia volunteer friend, cohort, partner in crime, Suba Sadi. Suba, let's get started. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Judy. Uh, good afternoon. And let me add in my welcome to everybody joining today. Uh, like Trudy said, I am Suba Sadi. I'm a volunteer community ambassador with ARP here in very windy Northern Virginia. So if I phase out, I'm going to cut out my video and you can still hear me. I'm still coming in okay, I think. Uh, from our earliest beginnings, ARP championed lifelong learning. That's why ARP Virginia is thrilled to bring you our third year. So I'm going to stop my video, folks, and we're just going to go. I think everybody can still hear me. Uh, bring you our third year of Tuesday Explorers, a lifelong learning program offered every Tuesday from January through the end of April at 3 o'clock Eastern time for Curious Explorers. For more than 60 years, ARP has been a wise friend and fierce defender, helping individuals to ensure that their money, health, and happiness live as long as they do. ARP has earned a reputation as a wise friend and fierce defender through trusted information, tools, and advocacy designed to protect the health and financial security of older Americans and empower them to choose how they live as they age. By promising to act as a wise friend and fierce defender, AARP is helping people who are 50 plus and their families feel confident, in control, and secure as they age. As a wise friend in your corner, AARP helps you protect yourself and your loved ones from fraud, get healthy and stay healthy, care for loved ones, make connections, plan a trip, learn new technologies, attend a class and have fun like we're going to do today with our Tuesday Explorers program. I hope you will take, continue to take advantage of these opportunities and more. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our guest today, uh, Blaine Amthor. Let me read a little bit about Blaine so you know a little bit about him. Blaine Amthor is a retired federal government employee with more than 36 years of service. So we thank you for that, Blaine. A Philadelphia native, he has had a long had a lifelong interest in history, particularly World War II, ocean liners, and the American Revolu Revolution. He enjoys visiting sites related to these subjects to learn about them in greater detail and to fully develop stories that he can use to educate audiences on important events. Blaine, thanks for joining us today, and the screen is yours, sir. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you for everyone who's attending online. So I appreciate the uh, interest and hope you'll find this an <clears throat> interesting topic. So to begin, uh, USS Enterprise is America's most decorated warship due to her outstanding service in the Pacific theater during World War II. Though the Japanese claimed to have sunk her three times, she remained a key factor during the fighting in the Pacific from the start of the war until the end. From the time she was launched, Enterprise seemed to be a special ship blessed with luck, outstanding personnel, and high morale. She was a leader in tactics and innovation. She produced a steady stream of leaders, many of whom went on to other successes during the war and in post-war life. Her crew composes a who's who of heroes, so many that just a few can be mentioned during this presentation. James Forrestal, Secretary of the Navy during World War II, described Enterprise as the one ship that most nearly symbolizes the history of the United States Navy in World War II. So it's quite a statement from a high up official. You know, if you look in the dictionary for the word enterprise, it's defined as boldness or readiness in undertaking, adventurous spirit, ingenuity. So I think during the course of this presentation, you'll see that the ship enterprise definitely meets that definition. And enterprise continued a long tradition of U.S. ships with that name. She was the seventh U.S. ship to have that name. 
and ships named Enterprise began in 1775 when Colonel Benedict Arnold, who played vital roles on land and sea during the Revolutionary War, captured the British ship George and renamed her Enterprise. And you can see on the top left, a painting of that ship, the first Enterprise. Okay, right there. And then the third Enterprise was a schooner used to capture pirate ships during the Barbary Wars of the early 1800s. And you see a sketch of that Enterprise on the top right. And as a, an example of the daring and the ingenuity associated with the term Enterprise, the ship's commanding officer, Lieutenant Stephen Decatur, executed a daring expedition to burn the U.S. Navy frigate Philadelphia in the harbor of Tripoli in 1804 to deny the Barbary pirates a prize ship. Now, on the bottom photograph, in 1936, the seventh Enterprise came into existence when it was launched on October 3rd at Newport News, Virginia. And this is the enterprise we will be talking about today. Now, just a little bit of background for origins of how enterprise came to be. <clears throat> the 1921 Washington Naval Treaty allowed for construction of a new type of ship, the aircraft carrier. And as a result of that treaty, the US built the ship on the top left, the USS Langley, which was actually a converted coal supply ship and was America's first aircraft carrier. And the ship was significant because it was on Langley that the basics of carrier operations were worked out. And then the next two ships carriers that America built are the two on the top right, the Saratoga and Lexington, which were converted battle cruisers, and they were launched in 1925. And then on the lower left was the next carrier, the USS Ranger, which was the first U.S. purpose-built carrier, but proved too small and slow to be effective in fleet operations. And the Ranger was launched in 1933. And then we go to the bottom right, and we come to the Yorktown class carriers, which were the first U.S. purpose-built large fleet carriers designed for long-distance, high-speed operations and with an ability to carry a large air wing of up to 90 airplanes. And this class consisted of three ships, Yorktown, Enterprise, and Hornet. Now these ships, the Yorktown class, were an outstanding design, meeting all design requirements for speed and endurance, adaptability to evolving aircraft, and high maneuverability a feature which proved critical for enterprise at key moments during World War II. Now, a little bit about enterprise itself. So just to give you an idea of the size of the ship, the length was 824 feet, 83 feet wide, and a total of about 25,000 tons. And she had a top speed of 32 and a half knots, which works out to be a little over 37 miles per hour and had a range of about 12,500 miles and a crew of about 2,500 during the war. And her air wing of up to 90 airplanes was divided among fighters, dive bombers, and torpedo bombers. And, and you can also see along here, there were three elevators on the flight deck, which connected to the hangar deck. So they were used to move aircraft up and down from the flight deck to the hangar deck. So these elevators actually will play part of the story that I'll tell you. Now, Enterprise was used in the filming of the 1941 movie Dive Bomber, starring Earl Flynn and Fred McMurray. And you see a poster for that on the left. Enterprise and her crew were loaned by the Navy for a week in spring of 1941 for filming with the movie featuring flight deck operations. And you can see some of those on the right. 
right. Enterprise was nicknamed the Big E. Now, this obviously represented the name Enterprise, but it also represented the coveted efficiency rating given by the Navy, representing a well-run ship in various ranking categories. So Enterprise received these E ratings for communications, engineering, and gunnery. In 1940, she set a fleet record for rapidly launching and recovering aircraft. She had many nicknames during World War II. She was also known as the Gray Ghost, the Galloping Ghost, and Lucky E. But the name, the Biggie, was the only one that ever really stuck. No matter the captain, Enterprise's crew was trained hard in realistic conditions, something that would benefit the ship in wartime. There was a tradition and expectation of teaching and passing along vital lessons and knowledge to younger or newer crewmen so that the ship's high standards would continue. Now, Pearl Har um, Enterprise was at sea during the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. She was scheduled to have been in Pearl Harbor at the time of the attack after delivering 12 Marine fighter planes to Wake Island. However, her arrival was delayed by a storm. But Enterprise was close enough to Pearl Harbor to have begun the routine practice of flying off her squadrons of aircraft to land at their home base of Pearl Harbor. So these planes that Enterprise had flown off to return to Pearl Harbor actually arrived 30 minutes into the two-hour attack, as well as during the evening of that day. And Enterprise su sustained losses of nine aircraft and some crew. So that took place on the very first day of the war. Enterprise arrived at Pearl Harbor the night of December 8th and sailed early the next morning in search of the Japanese attack force. And she sunk the first Japanese ship of the war, submarine I-70 on December 10th. So just three days in, after the attack, Enterprise was already playing a role in the war and making a name for herself and contributing to the war. Now, Enterprise went into action right at the start of the war. <clears throat> in January 1942, she participated in the raids on the Japanese base at Kwajalein Island. And then one month later in February, she participated in an attack on Wake Island right up here, which the Japanese had captured in December of 1941. And then in April, 1942, she participated in the Doolittle Raid against Japan. Now, the, the Doolittle Raid was the first strike against the Japanese mainland and showed Japan was not beyond the reach of the U.S., and it provided a much-needed morale boost for the American home front during a period of many defeats. Now, on this mission, Enterprise served as the escort to aircraft carrier Hornet in order to provide air cover since Hornet was carrying the Army bombers on her deck and was un unable to launch her own aircraft. The raid caused the Japanese to approve and expedite their Midway Island operation, which had been, up until that time, had been resisted by the Japanese high command. This would prove to be a momentous decision in the course of the war and in Enterprise role in it. In it. Now we move on to the Battle of the Coral Sea, May of 1942. This was the first battle in history between aircraft carriers and the first in which neither fleet sighted the other. The Japanese sought to occupy Port Moresby here on the southeast part of Papua New Guinea, as well as uh, Tulagi, which is just north here of uh, the island of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands chain. 
Now, this was an effort by Japan to cut off the air and sea links between the U.S. and our ally, Australia. This battle was a Japanese tactical victory because of the greater losses sustained by the U.S., but it was an American strategic victory because they stopped the Japanese expansion. Now, Enterprise and Hornet were rushed to Carl Sea immediately after the Doolittle raid in order to participate in the battle. However, they could not arrive in time. But this effort of sending them south to the Carl Sea was not wasted, as on their return to, to Pearl Harbor, they were ordered to pass near Tulagi, right here, in order to be cited by and convince the Japanese that they were sent to Carl Sea to replace the sunken carrier Lexington and the damaged Yorktown. Now, this ruse succeeded, leading the Japanese to believe Midway would be undefended by U.S. aircraft carriers when they attacked at Midway. Now, we move on to the Battle of Midway, June 1942. After the Battle of the Carl Sea, Japan planned to attack the U.S. base at Midway in order to consolidate its defensive perimeter, threaten Pearl Harbor, and draw out and eliminate the U.S. fleet. And you can see Midway is actually near the end of the Hawaiian island chain, so they would not be very far from Pearl Harbor and could be, pose a threat to Pearl Harbor. Since the U.S. had broken the Japanese naval code, it was aware of Japan's midway plans and stationed aircraft carriers Enterprise, Yorktown, and Hornet northeast of the island. At midway, Enterprise played a crucial role in winning the battle and stepped to the forefront of the fighting through the actions of several of its crew. Now, as soon as the Japanese attacked Midway Island, the three American carriers launched a large strike in an attempt to attack the Japanese carriers before they could locate and attack the American fleet. Due to miscommunications and launch delays, the American airplanes arrived at the Japanese fleet piecemeal. The torpedo bombers attacked first without fighter airplane protection and were almost completely wiped out. The dive bombers arrived just as the torpedo plane's attack was ending and were able to begin their attack unopposed. And so you can see two paintings here depicting the dive bomber attacks on the Japanese carriers. In just five minutes, they knocked out three of the four Japanese aircraft carriers, turning the tide of the Pacific War and avenging Pearl Harbor since these ships had launched that attack. Several Enterprise crewmen played a critical role in this attack and the battle's victory. Now we'll start with this gentleman on the top left, Wade McCluskey. He made one of the most critical decisions, not only of the battle, but of the war. When he arrived where the Japanese fleet was estimated to be, which was already at the fuel range limit of his squadron, it wasn't there. So he saw a single Japanese destroyer heading northeast at high speed and guessing it was rejoining the fleet. He followed it, found the Japanese fleet and attacked. McCluskey's action changed the course of the Pacific War since the dive bombers he led destroyed three of the four carriers in five minutes. While escaping after his attack, McCluskey was hit and wounded, and his plane landed back on Enter Enterprise with fewer than five gallons of gas and more than 55 bullet holes in it. He was awarded the Navy Cross for this action with unsuccessful later efforts to have it upgraded to the Medal of Honor. Later in the war, he commanded the escort carrier USS Corregidor, and he retired in 1956 as a rear admiral. And he's actually buried not too far from uh, Northern Virginia here at the US Naval Academy. 
And the impact of his career is shown by the McCluskey Award, which is given annually to the Navy's top attack units. He was elected to the Navy's Carrier Hall of Fame. The Navy guided missile frigate USS McCluskey was named after him. And in 2017, a statue of him was unveiled in his hometown of Buffalo, New York, as part of a new memorial dedicated to local war heroes. And you can see the artist there on the top right finishing that statue of him. And it represents him as he um, got out of his plane and stepped onto the deck of Enterprise after that critical attack. Now we'll move down here to the lower left and the center. And that's uh, Dusty Jack Dusty Cleese. Now Midway, he scored hits on the Japanese carriers Kaga and Hiryu and the cruiser Makuma, making him the only pilot to score three direct hits during the battle. He received the, a Navy cross for his efforts at Midway. He later became an instructor at the Advanced Carrier Training Group in Norfolk, Virginia, and retired as a captain and later worked as a part-time surveyor and a high school physics, math, and chemistry teacher in West Virginia. And he uh, actually retired to San Antonio, Texas, and lived a very long time, dying somewhat recently in 2016 at age 100, and is buried at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. Now, on the lower right is Dick Best. He was part of McCluskey's air group that attacked the Japanese carriers Kaga and Akagi. Due to a mis communication, all but three planes of McCluskey's squadron began attacking a single Japanese carrier. Best recognized this mistake immediately and with two other planes attacked a different carrier, scoring a lethal direct hit. Later that day, Best scored another direct hit on the remaining Japanese carrier, Hear You. So he became the first American pilot to bomb and get hits on two carriers in the same day. He died in 2001 at age 91 and is buried close by here at Arlington National Cemetery. Okay, here we go. Now we move on to August 1942 the Guadalcanal campaign. Enterprise's reputation was already well known. During a change of captains on June 30th, 1942, Captain George Murray told the new captain, Arthur Davis, I am confident you will find the ship, one of the great ships of our time and the ship's company, the finest. Now, the U.S. landed on Guadalcanal August 7, 1942, with carriers Enterprise, Wasp, and Saratoga providing cover for the landing forces. The Guadalcanal campaign proved to be a six-month-long slugfest for control of the entire South Pacific area and the, the vital links with our allies Australia and New Zealand. Central to this control was the island's airfield, Henderson Field, which the Allies had captured and Japan sought to retake. And you can see the location of Guadalcanal right here within the Solomon Islands chain. The two critical carrier battles took place at the Eastern Solomons in this general area here in the red circle and at the Santa Cruz Islands in this general area in the red circle. Now we'll start with the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, which took place in August 1942. This was the first carrier naval battle of the Guadalcanal campaign, which was a full Japanese effort to recapture the island and destroy the American carriers. It was here that Enterprise was seriously hit for the first time by three bombs while being attacked by 30 dive bombers. The first bomb hit was recorded in this remarkable photograph on the top left. 
And then you can, if you take a look at the photograph on the top right, you can actually see the hole that that bomb made going through the flight deck. And the lower left, you see at just at the bottom edge here, you can see that hole again, but another hit, which took place on the stern of the Enterprise where that smoke is coming. Yeah, due to um, outstanding damage control under the direction of Lieutenant Commander Herschel Smith, the fires were out soon and Enterprise maintained speed and operations during the battle. Now, this battle was a draw, but it delayed the Japanese efforts to recapture Guadalcanal. Now, we move on to the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, October of 1942. This was the second major Japanese effort to recapture Guadalcanal and eliminate the U.S. carriers. So you, so you get a theme here. They're always trying to knock out the U.S. carriers and regain control of Guadalcanal. Enterprise was hit by two bombs and due to her maneuverability, avoided nine torpedoes and remained in action. And again, in this another remarkable photograph here on the lower right, you see a near miss from a bomb from one of the Japanese dive bombers. Now, the U.S. was again able to thwart the Japanese efforts to recapture the island. Following the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, Enterprise's performance was such that its captain recommended over 70 medals and commendations. And a testament to the efficiency of the crew was that the captain at this battle Osborne Hardison had assumed command only five days prior to the battle. So you have a brand new captain, but this crew was clearly efficient and knew what it was, it was doing. Now at the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, two Enterprise scout planes located the Japanese carriers and without any support, attacked, scoring two hits on one of them taking her out of the battle before it had even begun. These pilots, Lieutenant Bernie Strong, who was a DC native, you see him on the top left, and Ensign Charles Irvine demonstrated the aggressiveness that was characteristic of Enterprise's crew. And they made good on a similar situation during the Battle of the Eastern Solomons when they had radioed the enemy's position, but did not attack. And so this had always irked uh, Bernie Strong because he had said after the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, if I ever find myself in that situation again, I'll attack. So just a couple of months later, he finds himself in the same situation and attacks and scores two hits on a carrier. Now, Strong fought the entire war on Enterprise and ended his Navy career with two Navy crosses the Distinguished Flying Cross, and 10 Air Medals. Another Enterprise hero was the gentleman on the lower left, who's Lieutenant Stanley Swede Vedasa. At the Battle of the Coral Sea, when he was flying off the carrier Yorktown, he helped sink the Japanese carrier Shoho and shot down three Japanese fighters while piloting a dive bomber. Now, this was a remarkable feat because a dive bomber was not designed to engage Japanese fighters, but he managed to shoot down three of them. He then transferred to fighters on Enterprise because people realized, hey, this guy's a pretty good fighter pilot. So now he's part of the fighter squadron on Enterprise. And in one flight, he shot down seven Japanese planes attacking Enterprise at the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands. He received the Navy Cross for each of those actions, becoming the only carrier pilot to receive this award for dive bombing and aerial combat. He later served in Korea and ended his career with over 700 carrier landings. He later commanded the Miramar Naval Air Station, the first home of the Top Gun School. And he was another person who lived a long life. He died in 2013 at the age of 98. Now we'll go over to the photo on the right and the gentleman in the foreground, who is Landing Signal Officer Robin Lindsay. 
Now, he managed to land all of Enterprise's airplanes at the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, despite the forward elevator being out of commission from one of the hits the ship took. And so that meant they weren't able to move the planes from the flight deck down to the hangar deck. So they kept pushing the planes to the front of the ship. So he managed to land all of Enterprise's airplanes and an additional 57 planes from the destroyed carrier Hornet. He also managed to bring those on board. And the last person to land that day was gentleman on the lower left, Swede Vetisa. And he had to make a perfect landing in order to be able to stop without hitting the planes that were already parked on the deck. Now, Enterprise returned to Guadalcanal in November 1942. After the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, Enterprise was the only U.S. carrier left in the Pacific Theater. The Enterprise crew created and displayed a banner that read Enterprise versus Japan. Now, this banner represented the desperate nature of the situation, but also the crew's strong resolve. Following Santa Cruz, Japan made another major effort to recapture Guadalcanal and its airfield, Henderson Field, while the U.S. reinforced its forces there. And you can see a photo of Henderson Field on the top right, which was a very crude, basically dirt airstrip on the island. Now, Enterprise partially repaired and in coordination with Marine air units on the island, attacked the Japanese transports on warships, sinking seven of the 11 transports before they could even reach Guadalcanal. And she sank the other four while they were unloading on the beach. And you see a painting of that on the lower right. Now, this greatly limited the Japanese effort to recapture the airfield and retake the island. Guadalcanal was finally secured in February of 1943, but the campaign was for months on the verge of failure, and any small factor could have caused it. One participant described it vividly as a high-stakes poker game. Japan had made the initial bet by seizing the island and building the airstrip. We had called and raised the bet when we captured it. The pot grew steadily as the two sides battled on land, on sea, and in the air. Had Enterprise and her crew not performed as well as she did, or had she been lost, the campaign certainly would have failed and Japan would have controlled the South Pacific, greatly impeding the Allied war effort there. The U.S. and Japan took the time following the Guadalcanal campaign as a period of recovery while planning their next moves. Now, after Guadalcanal, Enterprise returned to Pearl Harbor, during which he received the Presidential Unit Citation, the first ever for an aircraft carrier. And this citation covered eight actions from February to November of 1942. In July 1943, she sailed to Bremerton, Washington for a complete overhaul, which could not be done at the various forward bases where only essential repairs could be performed. And during this time, when she was at Bremerton, about 40% of her air crew turned over, but the well-known enterprise culture and efficiency remained even with new crew members. Now, the photo at the top here of Enterprise after that overhaul, she had a lot of changes made to her, but the most visible one is the camo camouflage paint scheme that you see there. Now, at this time, a new air group commander arrived, and this person was Lieutenant Commander Edward Butch O'Hare, who you see on the lower left. Now, he had already received the Medal of Honor for shooting down five Japanese planes 
becoming the first ace, Navy's ace of the war while defending his former carrier, USS Lexington, in February of 1942. And he later received the Distinguished Flying Cross for 1943 action near Wake Island. And he took over the Enterprise Fighter Group, which was known as the Grim Reapers. So it sounds like somebody you don't want to run up against. And he introduced the innovation of night fighting by using radar in torpedo bombers to guide fighters to intercept Japanese airplanes. Now, sadly, he was lost in action on November 26, 1943, during one of these night fighter flights. And his death was a big blow to Enterprise, her crew and Navy pilots in general. An Enterprise officer wrote to his widow saying that he never saw one individual so universally liked. And you can see here in the lower right, him receiving his Medal of Honor from President Roosevelt. Now, he had a uh, destroyer named after, after him, the USS O'Hare, which was launched in 1945. And if you've ever traveled across the country, chances are you've gone through Chicago's O'Hare Airport which was named after him, even though he was born and raised in St. Louis and never lived in Chicago. But his father was a lawyer who worked for the gangster Al Capone and later who helped the IRS arrest Capone on tax evasion charges. Robert McCormick, the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, proposed in 1947 that Chicago's new airport be named for Butch O'Hare who had often visited his father in Chicago. So the airport was named for O'Hare in 1949. And it's interesting, various sources uh, incorrectly state that O'Hare was from Chicago, including some information at the airport itself. So he never lived there. Though the U.S. carrier fleet had grown significantly, Enterprise remained critical to operations and actively engaged in combat. Her next campaign was in 1944 through the Central Pacific with the aim of reaching the Philippine Islands and closing in on Japan. And you can see this red line here shows the course of the Central Pacific campaign. And it began down here on the lower right in the Gilbert Islands with the capture of the Japanese seaplane base at Macon Atoll and the strongly fortified base of Tarawa Island. And then they move on to the Marshall Islands and the capture of Kwajalein Island, a key Japanese naval and air base. And then they move on to the Caroline Islands right here and the uh, elimination of Troop Lagoon, a major Japanese naval base in the Central Pacific. And it was during this campaign in the Caroline Islands that Enterprise had the distinction of conducting the first night radar-guided bombing attack by a U.S. carrier. So yet another distinction for Enterprise. And then the campaign moved on to the Marianas Islands, which were 1,500 miles south of Japan, so they're closing in. Now, these islands contain ideal bases such as Tinian Island for long-range B-29 bombers to begin bombing the home island targets of Japan. And then later on, it's actually off the screen here at this point, but the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which was the largest aircraft carrier battle in history, in, in which the U.S. downed about 373 Japanese aircraft against a loss of just 29. And then later, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which was the largest naval battle in history. And this took place during the landings at the Philippine Islands. Now, Enterprise helped sink the Japanese battleship Musashi, which was one of the two largest battleships ever built. And Enterprise is the only carrier to engage all three groups of Japanese naval forces during the battle. 
So another distinction for enterprise. In February 1945, Enterprise began operating with other aircraft carriers in the seas off Japan, striking homeland targets. She supported the landings at Iwo Jima, keeping aircraft aloft for 174 consecutive hours, a feat unequaled during the war. While attacking the Japanese mainland, she was struck by a bomb in March of 1945. In April, she was damaged by a near miss by a kamikaze. After repairs and while operating off Okinawa, she was struck by a kamikaze on May 14th, destroying her forward elevator. The force of the impact and explosion threw part of the 15 ton elevator 400 feet into the air. And again, you can see this, that elevator piece right here in this remarkable photograph and the explosion from the kamikaze hit. Now this damage forced Enterprise to return to Bremerton, Washington for repairs. As she was preparing to sail for Pearl Harbor after completion of the repairs, Japan surrendered and the war ended. However, she sailed to Pearl Harbor and began participation in Operation Magic Carpet, the military's effort to return home servicemen as quickly as possible. Now, she returned 1,100 personnel on this initial Operation Magic Carpet trip. And you can see they packed in as many troops as they could. And you can see a photo here of this five high standy bunks, right? And then on the right, now this is not Enterprise, this is Saratoga, but you can see some of those troops on deck getting some air, but they were putting as many people as they could on these ships to return them home as quickly as possible. So after completion of this initial Operation Magic Carpet voyage, she sailed to New York and was a star in the Navy Day celebrations on October 27th, 1945 receiving more than 250,000 visitors. So people knew Enterprise through the reporting throughout the course of the war, newspapers, radio accounts, things like that. And people wanted to see her. Operation Magic Carpet continued with Enterprise sailing between Europe and the US. She returned more than 10,000 veterans during several voyages. Upon arriving in the U.S. on Christmas Eve, 1945, after a magic carpet voyage, Enterprise received a call on Christmas Day from a home for orphaned boys stating that they had no hope for a Merry Christmas and asking if the Big E could help. A meal and a party were quickly planned and for 140 boys, and according to accounts, it was difficult to tell if the boys or the crew had more fun. On one trip, Enterprise was boarded in England by the British First Lord of the Admiralty, Sir Albert Alexander, who presented the ship with a British Admiralty pennant. This was presented as a token of respect from an ally. Enterprise is the only ship outside the Royal Navy ever to have received this more than 400-year-old pennant. So again, another distinction for Enterprise. By the end of the war, Enterprise had participated in 20 of the 22 major actions of the Pacific Theater, earning 20 battle stars. Her planes and guns downed 911 enemy aircraft. Her bomber sank 71 ships and damaged or destroyed 192 more. Though hit 16 times, she was the only carrier to serve during the entire war. And she received the Navy Unit Commendation and the Presidential Unit Citation. And 50 years after the war ended, she received another award, the Task Force 16 Citation in May of 1995. And this recognized Enterprise's participation in the Doolittle Raid of 1942. 
in a ceremony at the Pentagon, attended by more than 100 Task Force 16 veterans. Due to larger, more advanced carriers and aircraft, Enterprise was considered obsolete and was decommissioned at New York Naval, Naval Shipyard on February 17, 1947. <clears throat> and you can see her, this top left photo, her docked at the New York Naval Yard. And on the right is her hangar deck <clears throat> with a, uh, on the bulkhead there, an accounting of her actions. But this area right here is the presidential unit citation that she received. She was briefly considered for specialized roles such as, a, as an anti-submarine command ship, but nothing came of these ideas. Several efforts to save Enterprise failed, including one led by Admiral Bill Halsey, one of the men most associated with the ship. And you can see a sketch below here on the left of Enterprise and Admiral Halsey. Sadly, the ship that was Halsey's flagship during the critical first year of the war and was a flagship for many other admirals throughout the fighting in the Pacific theater could not be saved. She was sold for scrap in 1958 and was gone by 1960. And you can see on the lower right a photo of her being scrapped. <clears throat> However, some parts of Enterprise remain, such as the top left here, one of her anchors, which is at the Washington, D.C. Navy Yard. And next to it <clears throat> is the ship's bell, which is at the U.S. Naval Academy in front of Bancroft Hall, the huge dormitory there. And the bell is rung when Navy beats Army in football. And then on the next to that one, on the top right, you have the stern plate of Enterprise, which is in Rivervale, New Jersey, in a veterans park. And then uh, if you right below that, have circled in yellow here, Enterprise's tripod mast was to have topped the elevator tower at the um, Naval Academy Stadium, but this never happened. And then we move to the lower left here, and there's a permanent exhibit to Enterprise at the National Museum of Naval Aviation in Pensacola, Florida. And you can see it contains a large model of Enterprise. But in the background there, you'll see an American flag. And this is the flag that was flown during the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands and which was presented to Landing Signal Officer Robin Lindsay for his exemplary performance that day landing all those airplanes on the deck without the ability to move them down to the hangar deck. For many years, it was thought that this was the only surviving flag. However, in 1999, her commissioning day flag appeared, was verified as authentic, and put on display at Phoenix's Bank One ballpark. And recently, in June 2018, the National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas, received the flag of Enterprise's Torpedo Squadron 10, which was known as the Buzzard Brigade. And there was even a uh, TV series about Enterprise. History Channel's Battle 360 depicts the ship's career and features interviews with many of its crew members. Now, this series was sponsored by this company right down here in the lower right, Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Many of you probably recognize that logo. So you may wonder, is there a relationship? Well, there certainly is, because Enterprise Rent-A-Car Company was, is named after the ship because its founder, Jack Taylor, was a fighter pilot on Enterprise and gives his experience on the ship much credit for forming his character. And he said, I was a callow youth when I joined the Navy. And I came out of it with more confidence and feeling that I was going to live a happy life and do the right thing. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, 
Enterprise was the seventh Navy ship to bear that name. The existence of a Navy ship named Enterprise continued with the eighth ship with that name and true to Enterprise's history of innovation, held the distinction as the world's first nuclear powered aircraft carrier, which served for 56 years. And you see a photo of that enterprise on the top left. Its first commander, Vincent Dupois, was a fighter pilot on Enterprise during the Guadalcanal campaign and arranged for installation of several portholes from the Big E. And you see those portholes right here on the top right. Now, the name Enterprise will continue with a Gerald Ford class carrier, which is under construction and should be completed about 2027. And it is reported that these portholes from the Big E will be installed on this new Enterprise. The Enterprise name even reaches into space when NASA yielding to a huge letter writing campaign by Star Trek fans, changed the name of the testbed space shuttle from Constitution to Enterprise. Some of the cast of the original Star Trek TV series were on hand when the shuttle was unveiled after its construction. And you can see a photo of the TV cast members there in front of the testbed shuttle Enterprise. And you can tell from the leisure suits that most people are wearing. This was during the 1970s. So this took place in 1976. And there are ships named Enterprise that do not even exist. Perhaps the most famous one is the Enterprise of science fiction from the TV and movie series Star Trek, which you see on the lower left. Now, USS Enterprise seemed to be destined for greatness and achieved it during the world's largest war. She held the line in the Pacific Theater for about a year and continued to play a major role during the war after it had turned in favor of the Allies. She seemed to be expressly created to fight a certain war at a certain time in a certain theater. She always managed to be in the right place at the right time. Her crew was a long list of heroes and achievers who began a lineage of dedication, excellence, and high performance that was passed on to succeeding crew members. She produced 10 admirals, and four of her pilots were original members of the Navy's performance flying team, the Blue Angels. To her crew, she was not just a ship, but an institution, and she had a personality. Her performance was such that it ensured that her name would be passed on to new ships with the expectation that they live up to her standards. Though Enterprise no longer exists, her remarkable performance earned her the gratefulness of our nation and places her and the pantheon of legendary ships. And that's the end of the presentation. So any questions people have, I will attempt to answer them for you. <laughs> Lane, you were so thorough in this program. So far, I have no questions in either the chat or the Q&A, but we'll give it a couple minutes to see if any show up. But lots of good comments okay. saying, saying thank you. I do see one individual has a raised hand in webinar format. We cannot uh, acknowledge the raised hand format. So Arlene, if you could put your question or comment in the chat or the Q&A box, we'll do our best to get to it. But we're getting lots of, of thank yous and great job, Blaine, as usual. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Blaine has presented to us before. Amazing presentation, really enjoyed it. Yeah, hopefully you learned, uh, people learned something. You may, most people know that name, but perhaps not the story behind it. And that's just one ship named Enterprise, probably the most famous one. 
Yeah, I'm scrolling back because one of our guests had a comment about about uh, the enterprise, and I'm trying to see if I can get back to it. Okay. Um, oh, I see it. I see it now. This individual buried my father at sea on the USS Enterprise just before the turn of the century. It was a great closure for this individual and a fitting ceremony for their father, who spent so many years in the Navy and aboard aircraft carriers. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he was impressed and said he was looking forward to this presentation. Okay. Wow. Very interesting yeah. story. Okay, so I do have one question for you, Blaine, and that is, what is the superstition about renaming ships with the same name? Oh, well, um, sometimes, well, I don't know. It's just one of those <laughs> sailor superstitions that uh, if one ship is perhaps unlucky to name another ship the same name, the bad luck will continue. But also if it's, um, you know, a lucky ship like Enterprise was that perhaps the, the new ship, the luck will run out on that one. So it's just a sailor superstition. Yeah. And... That is all the questions I have. Um, Suba, are you still with us or did the wind knock you out? No, I'm here. <laughs> okay. I'm here. My video is actually working and hopefully it'll work in my parting uh, comments. Yeah. Okay. I don't think I have any additional questions. So Suba, I'm going to turn the program back over to you um, just with a lot of thanks and um, how much everyone appreciated this presentation, Blaine. Thank you. Sue, okay. I'll turn it You're back welcome. to you. Yeah, thanks, Trudy. Uh, yeah, Blaine, my thanks as well. Very thorough presentation like you always do. And that's a common thing in the military. We don't like to name things over and over again. That is a common, that's in the Air Force as, as well. So yeah, but again, I'd like to thank you uh, for sharing your valuable time and knowledge. Uh, one thing I learned from today's presentation, Blaine, that uh, I didn't realize the Japanese had claimed that it sunk the Enterprise uh, three times. So that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, but folks, um, we'd love to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few moments to share your feedback with us. We'll also send this link in a follow-up email later today. On Tuesday, Explorer programs will continue next week, and we invite you to join us. Uh, please look at, uh, of course, uh, a, uh, Trudy already put that out, but I'll, I'll shout it out again. It's www.aarp.org forward slash Tuesday Explorer. And we invite you back next week. Uh, Jim Lewis is going to be presenting uh, the CIA's biggest heist. So it'll be on next Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another great presentation as part of Tuesday Explorers. In, in a chat box, you'll also see a link to register for our upcoming programs, and that is www.aarp.org forward slash virtual VA. So until next time, we encourage you to stay curious and keep exploring. And again, thank you from all of us for uh, from ARP for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.